to look for after a hailstorm. Listen to the Yarlow Home Cringe Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. or on your favorite podcast app. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for showers and storms today with a high near 60. Tonight, rain with a low around 49. And Wednesday, more rain with a high around 56. Spring has arrived and it's time to take a good look at your lawn. If there's bare spots or brown patches, Natural Lawn can help. For over 30 years, Natural Lawn has taken an environmentally friendly approach to lawn care to feed your soil without unnecessary chemicals. Beat the summer rush and visit NaturalLawn.com. That's NaturalLawn.com. Portions of the following program may be pre-recorded. Broadcasting live on AM 950, the Progressive Voice of Minnesota, and on the evenings on WCPT 820, Chicago's Progressive Talk. It is the Matt McNeil Show for your Tuesday. Good to be with you today. It sounds like we do have a Patrick Hooligan sighting coming up here in the 4 o'clock hour from the Minnesota Reformer. Patrick, how are we today? Uh, doing well. It's uh, been a very rainy day up here in the uh, Twin Cities area. So always, always amazes me the same people who've been driving 65 miles an hour on ice and snow all of a sudden doing 25 miles an, an per hour in a rainstorm. But hey, you know, you do you. <laughs> it's, it's, wait, wait, wait a second. You remember when it was a glacier outside and you were basically, you know, doing fast and the furious on the streets? You know, it's it's not as bad now. Uh, 952-946-6205. 952-946-6205 is the phone. I'm actually going to ask a question because Patrick, you are a smarter tech guy than I am. And this is interesting. And I, and I didn't really think about bringing this up until just basically about five minutes before I, I left to come to the radio station. So we, like a lot of people have old tech, old computers and old iPad. I mean, ancient stuff. When you, when you go back and you look at it, you're like, wow, this seems like I'm doing an archeological dig. My goodness. And we have old things that we generally do not use anymore. The, I had, I, I had, I mean, it's gone now. We, we, it, this is kind of a question after the fact for us. I had an iMac, an old computer. This is the main computer I use at home, you know, mainly for photos for the kids and stuff like that. And, you know, whenever I have to do a remote show for some reason. But it's the, the main computer I have. I had an old iMac that was seven years old. I mean, it was thick, had a CD loader on it, right? One of those things. I couldn't even get the thing started back up again. I remember why exactly I had to replace it. So it wasn't, it wasn't giving, it wasn't even allowing me to go on there. Now I could have sworn when I got the new iMac seven years ago that we basically, the, 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 the Apple guy said, oh, well, we scrubbed the computer, the old one, the, the new one's got everything on it and it's fine. So I'm already believing for the most part that computer was safe. But I got, the, the question I have is, so I took it in, it, it got taken into a computer recycling place. You know, doing they're doing tech recycling. So old keyboards, stuff like this. Are there really criminal elements out there that are going to take a seven-year-old computer Try to get it going in, spend the 20 hours or so trying to even get the thing started back up again to look to see if there are seven-year-old passwords or seven-year-old data information that's on the computer that can, that, that, which once again, in this modern day and the age, they, all the, all the passwords have been changed like five times since I got this new computer. I've, I mean, you now you have two-tier authentication on anything. You know, you can't do anything without them. We're going to send you a, a text code. How dangerous is it that I, I couldn't get the computer on, so I couldn't verify what was on there? How dangerous is it that I got rid of the thing? I'd say probably not that dangerous. You've obviously had, will have some people with too much time on their hands, but Crime is usually an opportunistic element. It's not something that people are going to put 20 hours into. Maybe they get something that maybe works for them on the computer. Well, I imagine Elon Musk must just throw his into a wood chipper because that would be a guy whose computer could have some sensitive data on it. Oh, absolutely. You know, are they, for the average middle-class person out there, or for anyone, really, for that matter. I mean, if you, I mean, obviously, some of this stuff, like an old iPod or something like that. I mean, 
so they're going to be able to listen to your the old Led Zeppelin stuff. You know, that's okay. Well, all right. I don't know if that's really the big, the big, the big hit you think it's going to be. Keyboards and stuff like that are just, you know, they're basically tools. So there's nothing there, but an old iPad or an old iMac or an old, we, we had an old Dell tower that we got rid of as well. Now that one, we, we, we found out what you do is you basically, you, you pick the case off of it. We pulled the, the, the drives off of it, smash those up. And so that, there's nothing on those. I mean, that's easy. So this is kind of more just to the, the, you know, an iMac or I guess a computer that you can't start up that is self-contained that doesn't really have an easy way to, to, to get it open. Most of the stuff, I mean, isn't the bigger threat today online? I mean, it just, it's, you've got your Wi-Fi, you've got your online, you've got your cloud. I mean, it would seem to me if I'm trying to infiltrate someone's life that that's, as you just said, the path of least resistance would be to do it via that way, as opposed to get a lab, you know, where you're, you're breaking down an old iMac. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. And uh, people tend to be a lot more careless about what they're leaving around in the cloud and those other places that you were just talking about. So, you know, I, I kind of think that would be more of a threat than a seven-year-old computer. Yeah, because I'm, I'm wondering, it's like, okay, so... About two years ago, I had my Netflix password was being accessed in Nepal. That wasn't you, by the way, was it? You weren't wanting to try, you weren't in Nepal watching some some Netflix, right? Oh, I might have had a stopover <laughs> in Kathmandu some years ago. <laughs> I could look at the mountains here, but you know what I'm going to do? I got I, I'm going to I'm going to watch some old reruns of Frasier. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, some guy did that. My guess is that came off of either someone just outright guessing it. Or there was a data breach and those things are out there on the, cause we get those all the time. There's a data breach that, and this has nothing to do with us, you know, your, your bank or your, your, your mortgage company or your Amazon or something like that, or someone gets a, they, they hack the, the system and they get your passwords in there. I mean, that's what, that's a bigger problem I would think. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the guessing passwords thing is a little easier than it sounds. It's, it, it's a very strange thing. You you would think they wouldn't just be able to guess, but I think they do somehow get that figured out if you have an easy password. But yeah, well, I mean, and it used to be. I mean, I am I I was I'm Generation X, so I've watched this whole thing unfold. I remember when my password was my deep secret password was one two three four. Now it's a cavalcade of punctuation numbers, letters, capitalization, stuff like this, that, you know, it, it, and once again, and even if I do have all that, then I get this, we're going to send you a text message or an email to one of these two things, which one would you like? And yeah, I, I just, I don't, I don't know if it is. I mean, and this just might be one of these things where it's the tech issue of the day of our time is that, yeah, the day of people basically it, you know, if they're, if they're going to get a, you know, a phone or something like that, that's, you know, your current phone, I'm talking, once again, I'm not talking about a, a current phone. Imagine it's your iPhone from 10 years ago, or if you had an iPhone, your, 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 your Crackberry from back then, your Blackberry from back then, or a flip phone, a Motorola flip phone back then. Say it was one of those things. I mean, how dangerous would one of those things be? I, I got to imagine most of us had long since changed all the passwords and everything. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You, I mean, you do have, and all this kind of a tangent, but I think there are some things that you just should not save on a computer. Don't yeah. save. Don't save your password to your bank account. Don't save your password to other financial things that that other people might be able to get a hold of and get into and i'm not saying that's going to 100 percent proof somebody never getting into your bank account but um you know don't save credit cards don't save you know i well I just, and, and by the way you with the credit cards how crazy is it now that basically every place you know i, I mean even when i say i don't want to save this credit card uh, they'll say, do you want to use this credit card that I used in a previous thing? They already are saving the stuff, whether I want them to or not. And that's nuts. Uh, you're, you're, you know, I, I mean, I, I just, I think 
the days of, and by the way, if you want to chime in on this, if you are one of these computer expert people that has experience with, you know, you know, 284s or whatever the old computers were <laughs> with Pac-Man, <laughs> the bar tabletop Pac-Man. If you, I mean, you have, you have experience with old tech. I mean, how dangerous really is it? Because once again, it would seem to me the value of an old computer wouldn't be the hours and hours and hours. Once again, on a lot of these, you got to get them back up and working again, which, you know, th that was one of the other things, which was pretty funny. All the current keyboards and stuff I have wouldn't work with the old one. And so it was, it was kind of one of those things where it was, it was a little more difficult, but I, I mean, that's, that's a, I think a legit question is what, what do you, you know, it is, isn't the more valuable thing just the, the the electronics, the components themselves, the the metals or whatever it is in your computer? Isn't that the more valuable thing as opposed to the you know three days it would take you to get the thing up and running to get a, a maybe a password that hasn't been changed, which you would need to have two factor authentication for anyway? See, that's what I think we're really getting at here is they're not really interested in what's on the computer. It's the parts that can sell the you know any useful repair parts or metals as you were saying so i think that's more the interest with some of these old devices and correct me if i'm wrong just bringing up that point if they wanted to sell something off that you know an ancient mac to someone else wouldn't they clearly themselves wipe it clean because they just out of precaution because they won't want anyone saying oh well this was stolen yep exactly uh, i don't know it, like i said if you it is, it's interesting to go through this day and age in our life where, you know, we, we, you know, I grew up in the pre-technology days and now I am fully immersed in the technology. And this is an interesting discussion because one of the things that used to happen is technologies generally used to stay with certain generations. A great example of that was music. I, from my grandparents, inherited a whole bunch of albums that they never once upgraded. They never had any intention of getting CDs. They never, they never wanted to get eight tracks. They, they didn't want an MP3 player per se. They liked their old albums. And I still have a bunch of them in my basement that I inherited from my grandparents that, yeah, that was that. The, my kids look at my CD collection like they found a Tyrannosaurus Rex buried in the dirt. CDs, what in the world? I mean, and as a matter of fact, it was funny because when I pulled out the old iMac, my current one doesn't even have a CD-ROM on it. It, 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 it. You know, you can't even play the damn things anymore. And so, you know, it was kind of one of those things where generations used to stay with certain technology and they don't do it anymore. It just is, I think, because of that, and I think especially because of the way we use technology today, if someone is trying to rob something from you, I, you know, especially if it's seven-year-old data, They'd have to spend the time. I got to imagine that that's more of a headache than anything else. And you, you know, like I said, it used to be when they started this, they'd say, take it to the wood chipper, chuck it in there just to be safe. Now it's like, you know, uh, you know, good luck, I guess. That's the way we, I'm, at least that's how I looked at it. And needless to say, they're gone. If you have thoughts, let me know. It's the Matt McNeil show here on a Tuesday. Hey, it's Tom Hartman with Earth Month in full swing. Let's talk about how we can all make a difference for our planet. And what better way to do that than by harnessing the power of the sun? Solar energy is clean, renewable, and it's key to reducing our carbon emissions. And when it comes to solar installation in Minnesota, there's no one better than all energy solar. They've worked on thousands of projects, each custom designed for everything from single family homes to large commercial buildings. And with over 1,800 five-star reviews, you know you're in good hands with All Energy Solar. But here's the best part. Once All Energy Solar installs your system, it's hassle-free. It quietly harnesses the sun's energy, cutting your energy bills without any effort on your part. So let's make Earth Month more than just once a year. Take the first step toward a greener future by visiting allenergysolar.com for your free solar site assessment. That's allenergysolar.com. And tell them Tom sent you. Car shopping is made super easy with Rudy Luther Toyota's Luther Direct. It's car shopping without ever leaving your home. 
Go to RudyLutherToyota.com and click on Luther Direct. Choose any vehicle in Rudy Luther Toyota's current inventory, either new or certified pre-owned. Then find out what kind of value you can get for your trade-in, review a payment plan you qualify for, and customize it. And then set up a time for Rudy Luther to drop off your new vehicle and pick up your trade-in. It's that simple. Your new vehicle comes to you without any of the hassle. Check out Luther Direct today at RudyLutherToyota.com. Gear up for a day of community spirit. Edina Rides for Education invites you to roll into a fun day of biking on Saturday, May 4th, starting at Fred Richards Park. Organized by the Rotary Club of Edina Morningside, they're all about service above self, and they're calling on you to join the ride. Opt for a leisurely 5- or 10-mile route and explore the scenic, car-free bike paths Edina has to offer. And here's the best part. Your ride with Edina Rides supports local educational nonprofits like the Edina ABC program. They're all about empowering students of color. And get this, 99% of Edina ABC students graduate Edina High School and attend a four-year college or university. Your participation helps sustain organizations like Edina ABC. Registration is easy at edinarides.com. Take advantage of early bird pricing, just $25 for adults and $15 for kids. So gear up and pedal for a purpose on Saturday, May 4th with Edina Rides for Education. More at edinarides.com. Connections Radio Show is all about tapping into our hardwired hunger to connect. We examine meaningful connections to ourselves, our community, and the world around us. By opening the door to innovative insights by a wide variety of interesting guests, we'll make the connections to something bigger than ourselves. Join me, Lori Fitz, your host of Connections Radio Show, and together we'll make the connections. Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. It's the Matt McNeil Show here once again on your Tuesday, 952-946-6205, 952-946-6205. So I, I made this post earlier today, and I'm going to bring this up because it, it, it's relevant to the, the Supreme Court hearing today. Um, Republicans, when they refer to people who beat cops, destroyed the Capitol building, stole things from the Capitol building, threatened to kill the vice president of the United States, and left their feces all over the Capitol, oh, that was harmless fun. Yesterday, when there were some protests out there blocking roads, uh, Senator uh, Cotton suggested take matters into your own hands, a.k.a. murder these people for peaceful protest across the road. It is, once again, the standard I'm putting out there that the Republicans have this when it's on their side. And, and I talked about this for the folks in Chicago. I talked about this at length back when they were they they were all upset about you know you know black lives matter protests and the protests um the 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 you know just the, the 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 peaceful marches that happened after george floyd as well that they were like you know if they're blocking a road run them down and i said the same people who were screaming that a black lives a peaceful black lives matter protest blocking a road you should run them down kill as many as you want and say that you just did your job if the protest was to lock Hillary Clinton up, not only would they not be saying that that's a bad thing if the road was blocked, they would be sprinting to the front of the protest so that they could get photos of them blocking the road themselves. The hypocrisy is never ending. Let's take us to our current conservative Supreme Court, who, once again, we all saw what these people did. The Supreme Court cast doubt on the legality of obstruction charges lodged against some 300 rioters arrested for breaking into the Capitol on January 6. The court's conservatives questioned whether the 2002 uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which was aimed at corporate accounting fraud, can be used more broadly to prosecute those who obstruct any official proceeding, including Congress's 2021 certification of President Biden's election victory. Now, here's where I'm going to call them out. If somebody came into a Supreme Court hearing and started leaving their feces all over the place and beating the bailiffs and whatever the case may be, I guarantee you these same exact Supreme Court justices was like, you know, the Barnes Oxley Act very clearly says you can't do this. It's funny. As long as it's not their official proceeding being upset 
well, wait a second here. Conservatives, you say, that were, we were trying to overthrow the government? Well, that was harmless fun. But I guarantee you it would be a very different story if this was a group of people trying to take over the Supreme Court for a day or so. Justice John Roberts and Gorsuch noted that the law made it a crime to destroy or conceal documents to impair an official proceeding, but they voiced doubt over extending that to any disruptions of a proceeding. If someone pulls a fire alarm to delay a vote in Congress, is that a federal felony subject 20 years in prison, Gorsuch asked. Well, I got news for you. They didn't pull a fire alarm. They basically brought guns and pitchforks and hockey sticks and beat cops. Which, by the way, once again, I, if you're a Capitol Police officer, how happy are you going to be if this Supreme Court basically overturns this and then they expect the Capitol Police to, hey, you guys need to get over here and make sure I'm safe. Sure, sure. While the justices sounded divided, most of the conservatives suggested they were skeptical of upholding the obstruction charges. Such a ruling would deal a blow to the January 6th prosecutions, but it would not prevent punishing them for their actions. More than 1,200 rioters were arrested at the January 6th break-in at the Capitol. Most were charged with assaulting the police officers who were on duty or with disorderly and disruptive conduct. Some were also charged with carrying dangerous and deadly weapons. A few hundred were also charged with seeking to obstruct an official proceeding. One of those was Joseph Fisher, an off-duty Pennsylvania police officer, who said on social media that he expected the attack on the Capitol might get violent, but that it was needed to send a message that the people hold the real to the people that hold real power. So basically, he's admitted, "Yep, I was there to basically be violent because we needed to do that." When Fisher was arrested, he was charged with six counts of assault and disruption, as well as the seventh charge of obstruction, a charge which could send him to prison for several years. The federal judge rejected the obstruction charge, but the U.S. Court of Appeals restored it in a 2-1 decision. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court heard an appeal from Fisher's public defender contending the obstruction charge should be thrown out on the grounds that the law protects only documents and evidence, not the proceeding itself. Well, wait a second here. I mean, there was a legit, okay. I mean, you, you're, you I think for the Supreme Court to be going down this path, they're intentionally being obtuse. What do you think would have happened if all those riders had gotten in there and all the, the ballots from the, the states, the electoral college ballots from the states were still there? You think for one second that they would have, well, we can't touch those. That would be obstruction. I mean, they were building a gallows to kill the vice president of the United States. <laughs> it, their vice president, the Republican vice president of the United States. If they would have captured any, I know that their fantasy was to get like an AOC or an Ilhan Omar, but if they would have caught any House or Senate member, Republican or Democrat, they would have torn them to shreds. I think the threat was there, for goodness sakes. You basically saying, but they didn't. So at the end of the day, I guess no blood, no foul. Well, I think there's some Capitol Police officers that would like to dispute that with you. Solicitor General Elizabeth uh, Prologar said the January 6th rioters intended to obstruct Congress from tallying the Electoral College votes to certify Biden's victory. It was obstructive conduct and exactly what the words of the law say she argued. But the Chief Justice disagreed. The obstruction clause does not stand alone. He said it is controlled by the earlier reference to documents and records. He said, funny story, funny story. There's a there's a there's a some earlier words in the Second Amendment. Uh, in order to have a well-regulated militia. Uh, but yet the Supreme Court seems to want to ignore all those words. Ha! These guys are just making this up as they go. Once again, the Supreme Court has said, well, before this Supreme Court, that, yeah, the, the intention of the Second Amendment was that, you know, guns should be regulated in order to have a well-regulated militia. That's actually in the Second Amendment. This current Supreme Court has ignored those words distinctly because they only focus on the back half. Now, now it's convenient for them to get their January 6th buddies off the hook. The Supreme Court all of a sudden is like, well, wait a second here. We need to look at the entire language here, even though you're correct. That is obstructive conduct is exactly what the words say. Well, what they were referring to was, you know, paper. All right. I see. Um, yeah, I, I think that what you're going to do is they're going to come on out there and they're going to try to like, well, just for the record here, come on guys, you know, just for the record, 
we're not for trying to overthrow the government of the United States. I think, I think we all agree that's not good. But, you know, you can't be so harsh on these guys. They're cuddly little buddies. They're our friends. They're sending love messages to Clarence Thomas in the RV. Come on. How bad can they be? The hypocrisy, like I said, once again, if this was on the Supreme Court, I guarantee you they wouldn't even be talking about this in any capacity. I guarantee you as well, if it was the Second Amendment, that first clause, they have a tendency of skipping over that. They're just making it up as I go. Uh, We'll take a break. Come back. It's the Matt McNeil Show. Come see the train chimp. It's the Matt McNeil Show, 3 to 5 p.m. weekday afternoons, right here on AM 950 KTNF, St. Louis Park, Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is Chad, owner of AM 950. Our station is located on a marsh, and we do our best not to disturb that environment. So I was thrilled to discover Natural Lawn. Their safer products and soil tests ensure that your lawn will be healthy, lush, and green. I don't even have to worry about bringing my furry friend to the station, thanks to the great care from Natural Lawn. I highly recommend Natural Lawn to keep your lawn beautiful, healthy, without compromising safety and sustainability. More at naturallawn.com. Greg Bakken here. I've told you about the -the out-of-the-world roast beef sandwiches at Maverick's Real Roast Beef, but I haven't told you about their Philly steak sandwiches, turkey bacon avocado sandwich, BLT, crispy chicken, fish sandwiches, brisket, or pulled pork. Okay, you get the idea. They make a lot of delicious food to the same standard as their famous roast beef sandwiches, and now I'm starving. I'm going to go to Maverick's Real Roast Beef off Lexington and Roseville, and you need to go too. Check out their menu at maverick'sbeef.com. Hey, it's Patrick for Zero Res. I'm going to get right into it. You should call Zero Res to beat the spring cleaning rush with big savings and priority booking by calling our cleaning heroes today. You should think about the dust, dander, and bacteria that's been breeding in your carpet all winter long with nowhere to go. And don't forget about your air ducts. If they're dirty, your air quality suffers. Indoor air quality is an issue year-round, but all that pollen is getting ready to come out of hibernation and into your home. This month, get three rooms zero resified starting at just $129 and take 75 bucks off any air duct cleaning. You owe it to yourself and your family to breathe happy, healthy, and clean. Call 952-ZERO-RES or go to ZeroResMinnesota.com and ask for the AM950 special. Zero Res, backward or forward, spells the same. AM950, KTN up St. Louis Park, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Step into a world of financial empowerment with the Do Different Better show. I'll be your host, Elaine Rasmussen. Join me Sundays at noon on AM 950 as we do a deep dive into wealth education with topics like investing, real estate, and entrepreneurship. No nonsense, tell like it is, keeping it 100 for everyday people like you. Tune in to get practical insights to rewrite your financial future. So each Sunday at noon, let's do different better. You can hear Do Different Better anytime on your favorite app. Learn more about me at socialimpactnow.com. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for showers and storms today with a high near 60. Tonight, rain with a low around 49. And Wednesday, more rain with a high around 56. Nightingale in Minneapolis is your perfect neighborhood gathering spot. Treat your taste buds to their famous Nightingale burger and fries, roasted duck breast, or try their unique offerings like the roasted broccoli bruschetta and smoked chicken liver plate. Can't stay? No problem, as Nightingale offers convenient takeout orders. More at NightingaleMPLS.com. Broadcasting in the evening on WCPT 820 Chicago's Progressive Talk and in the afternoons on AM 950, the Progressive Voice of Minnesota. It is the Matt McNeil Show. 952-946-6205. 952-946-6205 is the phone number. Uh, the uh, Another person basically saying, well, as long as, you know, it, you know, it, your current passwords and stuff are pretty much, it'd be very difficult. If they've been upgraded, it'd be very difficult for them to get access to it. Um, there wouldn't be anything on there. I mean, those are old passwords. It'd be like basically going to your first computer back, you know, in, in, you know, in the 1990s and trying to use the computer passwords on that, on your updated things, you know, your one, two, three, four back then. He, he did say, he did make a point. No one should ever have their social security card, social security number, or your birth certificate or any other, like your passport, any other official documents, uh, you know, images of those on your computer. You probably shouldn't be doing that. 
But I mean, yeah, the credit card thing is interesting, isn't it, Patrick? I mean, we they they they're just everywhere. I mean, once you use it once, it was it's always the default one. It'll say, "Do you want to use this?" Even though you said, "Don't save it." That's interesting because I've never really run into that. I will have my browser ask me, "Do you want to save this credit card for future use?" And I'll say no because I don't want my credit card stored on my computer like that. But I think I just think that's. I just feel like that's asking for trouble. Well, you remember when you do, when they started the phone thing where you could put your phone up against it, you know, that that thing? I said, well, obviously, isn't that, you know, you're then sending your credit card number through this, the, the air. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that why we're not supposed to do that? I, I was always a little concerned about that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm going to, you know, I don't think, I just, I don't think anyone's taking, I mean, I mean, I, once this is, this is after the fact, the stuff is gone now, but. I don't think anyone is taking a, you know, ancient and by the way, mildew covered. So good luck with that old computer into the lab because we got gold here. Oh, look, it's, 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 it's pictures of Matt from when he was in the military trying to pose and look like he was, he's a fancy pants. I don't, I'll give you those photos. You want to see me buff Matt from the military with a full head of hair? Just drop me a line. I'll send you the photo. Okay. Nine, five. Only fans. A 952 946. I mean, is that what I'm really making? I mean, I think the real lesson we've learned is I need an OnlyFans page. That's I, I think really that's what we've learned here. All right. So uh first of all, uh Trump Van Winkle was back in court today. Former President Donald Trump seems to be having a difficult time keeping himself alert during the criminal trial. Frank uh Runyon, a reporter for Law 360, brought word this morning to his Twitter account the former president started nodding off again in court on Tuesday morning. Dude, when you're staying up all night long posting crap on Truth Social, I mean, that's that's what your problem is. In fact, Trump had such trouble staying awake on Tuesday, he gave a detailed blow-by-blow account. Trump's head slowly dropped, his eyes closed. It jerked back upwards. He adjusts himself. He Then his head drops again. He straightens up, leaning back. His head drops for a third time. He shakes his shoulders, eyes still closed. His head drops. Finally, his eyes pop open. This comes just one day after New York Times reporter Maggie Hab- Haberman uh, and other journalists spy Trump dozing during the first day of his criminal trial on Monday, which sparked furious denials from Trump and his allies. Trump is in court this week. Okay, if you're going to deny it, then get the dude some no doze or something and keep him awake. Get him an extra cup of coffee or something so he's not falling asleep at the table. You know, it, don't let it happen the next day again. Uh, heading into the court on Tuesday, Trump once again angrily attacked the judge for hitting him with a gag order that prevents him from attacking witnesses at the trial. Trump's trial. And once again, the whole argument is he wants to attack, and particularly attack the judge, and then argue the judge can't be fair against him because there's all this animosity between the two of us because I kept insulting him. Our legal system in this country is absolutely blanked, isn't it? It <laughs> Um, yeah, Trump's trial related hush money payments is far from the only legal trouble he faces. Many legal experts have called the other charges that have been leveled against him, including allegedly trying to defraud the U.S. state's government with a scheme to legally stay in power and allegedly obstructing government efforts to retrieve top secret government documents from his Mar-a-Lago result as significantly more serious. But, you know, yeah, remember Trump, what he's, I think he's terrified. Those are kind of yawn fest. There's not going to be any great moments with those. But having a porn star coming up on the stand and talking about giving a detailed account of Donald Trump's, you know, bait, you know, tackle box. I, I think that that he knows that that's not going to go away anytime soon. Hello, Melania. Hello. You were pregnant. Oh, is she pregnant or she, she just had the kid. You were home with the kid. How was that? He was out there with the porn star. Hey, Melania mystery why you're not so much on the campaign trail at this point. All right. So I'm going to come back to Trump here in just a little bit because I got to talk, talk more about Trump stock, which is, you know, get, get the, get the slide whistle sound effect going down. Cause it is falling down, but I'm going to stop off at one of my favorite topics, Mike Lindell. I, I think Mike's in big trouble here. Uh, voting machine company Smartmatic has requested a status hearing due to MyPillow CEO Mike Lindell's deteriorating financial condition. Smartmatic filed the five-page motion Tuesday after a series of defamation claims initiated 
initiated by U.S. Dominion Incorporated and Dominion Voting Systems against Lindell and MyPillow regarding their statements about the 2020 presidential election. In a counterclaim, Lindell accused Smartmatic of participating in a conspiracy with Dominion. The court dismissed those claims, by the way, though, in 2022, but it never decided what fines Lindell and his lawyers would be required to pay. According to the filing, Lindell and MyPillow were millions of dollars in arrears to the former legal representatives raising concerns about their ability to fulfill financial obligations. Given the recent representations about their financial condition, including the need to hire new counsel, Smartmatic is concerned about its ability to collect the fees and costs incurred. The counsel for Smartmatic stated in a motion, the request for a status conference aimed to prompt the court to act on pending proceedings and determine the amount of fees owed to Smartmatic under the 2022 order. The voting machine company first filed a defamation lawsuit against Lindell in 2022 following similar legal, similar legal action by Dominion. Lindell knows exactly what he's doing, and it's dangerous. Mr. Lindell knows he can sell xenophobia. He knows he can sell conspiracy theory. And, of course, Mr. Lindell, the My Pillow guy, knows he needs to sell pillows to keep his increase in his fortune. Mr. Lindell saw a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity following the 2020 election. Smartmatic's lawsuit has stated. Um, I, I, you know, once again, I want to step back and for the folks in Chicago, my pillow is actually a company up here. And there's a lot of people who are not Mike Lindell that are employed by this company. And at this point, I mean, the question is how long is that company even going to be open or is it going to be my pillow or smartmatic pillow or dominion pillow? I don't know. There's not much left that this guy has, but it is interesting to, to kind of stop and think about the course of action that he and Giuliani and all these people, Bannon and Stephen Miller, one guy, one guy, Jared, Jared got a payday being around Trump because he was the son I wish I always had. Hi, dad. It's Don Jr. and Eric. I have no idea who you are. Jared is the one guy because of his position was able to pocket obscene amounts of money from foreign governments. And he had a big payday. The rest of these guys saw in 2015, 2016, when he started running for office, the cash cow campaign this guy was and thought to themselves, I just have to hook my wagon, my, my, my wagon to his horses and off I go. And he and Giuliani and many others you know, they, they, they're out there right now trying their best to carve out a niche. Well, one thing you sh they, they fail to understand about Trump is that Trump doesn't like to share. And with Trump's legal problems and other issues, the people that are willing to scratch out a substantial check and send it to some right-wing pundit, they're going to look to give it to Trump. And Trump, it, I think one of the reasons why you see Bibles and sneakers and stuff is even he is seeing that the, 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 the diamond has lost a bit of its luster and that he needs to basically encourage people, Trump stock, and I'll come back to that in a second. He needs to give people feeling like they're getting some sort of value and then they'll empty out their bank accounts for him. And so that's why, you know, he, you know those Bibles are probably 40 cents each. 50 cents each. And he's selling them for what, 75 bucks a piece? I mean, those sneakers, those sneakers literally like Homer made them in the garage. And he's selling them for $300 each. And everyone thinks that you can actually wear them. I, what, I mean, how many minutes after you put them on is all of a sudden like the soul going to just fall off the thing? Seriously. And he knows that you can sue him all day long because you, you know, a false thing, but he won't ever pay. I mean, these are so minuscule cases. He doesn't care. He just, it's a money grab for him. Meanwhile, the people that listen to him, particularly Giuliani and Mike Lindell, they're the ones that, because they, they went with the narrative, they drank the Kool-Aid. You know, they, you know, Giuliani was, was Trump's foot soldier in Georgia. And he basically went out there to, to, to smear those two campaign workers and he got everything he deserved and nothing hurts these people more. Nothing hurts these people more than 
losing everything. I mean, it's, these are people that have, that like to portray themselves as wealthy and rich and neither Lindell or Giuliani at the end of this is going to have anything left. And by the way, speaking of, um, Smartmatic, according to an announcement from an attorney for uh, OANN, the right wing news outlet has settled a defamation suit brought by the voting tech giant Smartmatic over false claims about rigged voting machines in the 2020 election. OAN attorney Chip Babcock, wow, told CNN that the suit has been resolved pursuant of confidential agreement. Also releasing a statement with Smartmatic's lead attorney, Eric Connolly, who said the company has resolved its litigation against OAN through a confidential settlement. The CNN pointed out both parties were mum on the specific details of the settlement. I can tell you right now from the Fox News settlement, settlement for Dominion, it's the question is not whether it was nine figures, because I'm going to guarantee it was nine figures. How high of the nine figures it was at? Because, yeah, that was kind of the set tone. So maybe Smartmatic left him off the hook and got this trial over with, and it's, you know, I'm pure speculation, pure speculation. $250 million, $300 million. And, you know, they're doing that. They're cutting that check quickly because they don't want it to be $800 million. And I don't think, does it, OAN have that much money left anymore? I mean, that's, that's a legit question. Smartmatic has additional lawsuits pending targeting Fox News and Newsmax. According to CNN, OAN is the most extreme of the conservative right news networks that broadcast the false claims about 2020. And that's the other thing, too. OAN was, like, fully in. Yep, nope, these were fraudulent. It wasn't like Fox where they're in trouble for, was it Lou Dobbs and uh, Maria Bartolomo and just a handful of people that were out pushing it. The entire network at OAN was basically pushing this, all the guests, all the hosts. And it wasn't until the end that they basically, well, wait a second here, before we get sued, you know, we don't know for sure this is happening, but the damage was done. I'm going to guess it was, I'm going to guess 500 million. I'm going to guess that's the case. We won't find out, but that would be my guess. Eventually we will. Someone will eventually blab, you know, years, years later, that will eventually happen. So. One final thing before I get into the break here. Trump stock is not, not doing well. Uh, where is it? it? Where did it close here today? Wow. <laughs> that is, that is a fall. It closed at 2284. It was down. Um, it, 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 you got to see that the, the, this trajectory it's had this last week. It has just been brutal how badly it's been getting beaten and it's down. We have to remind people that this is a stock that at one point was trading nearly at $80 a share. Today it's at 2284. So if you bought a thousand shares at $75,000, $75 per share, you spent $75,000 and today you have got $22,000. And it's, and it's never going to go back. It's never going to go back. Um, the, you know, Trump basically has the majority shareholder who owns nearly 60% of the stock. I've already done the math on it. He went from what, $4 billion. I think today he's probably down to a 1 billion. That's in about a month. He's lost three quarters of what that was worth. And it's still going to go down. We'll take a break. Come back. It's the Matt McNeil Show here on your Tuesday. Hi, I'm Mary T. Inviting you to experience our integrative Mary T. Health and Wellness Center, offering physical, occupational, speech, and lymphedema therapies. Experience our guided imagery, meditation, Tibetan medicine, dry needling, massage services, including cupping and oncology massage. Sign up for our free wellness screenings and learn more at MaryTWellness.com. All major health insurance providers are accepted. Come for therapy. Experience wellness. Hi, this is Ken Hakeland, host of Living Healthy and Aging Well, inviting you to listen to our live call-in talk show airing every Saturday from noon to one, where we talk about your health and your life and provide insights you need to know to live and age well. Each week, we talk with guests who provide answers to important questions regarding health care, elder care, end-of-life care, and self-care for caregivers, and help you and your loved ones plan for the future and enjoy your highest quality of life today. Please join us every Saturday from noon to one on AM 950 for Living Healthy and Aging Well. 
Hi, Penny here from Nightingale in Minneapolis. Exciting news. During the warmer months, we're extending our charm to the patio. Imagine savoring your favorite dishes outside surrounded by the lively energy of South Minneapolis near 26th and Lindale. And guess what? Nightingale's patio is not just a dining space. It's also dog friendly. Craft cocktails, curated wines, and half-priced bottles of wine on Mondays are still part of the deal. Open daily 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. with a full menu until midnight. Join us at Nightingale where good times and great flavors come together. Hey there, Twin Cities. This is Andy Otto, your host for Twin Cities Pride Amplified. Join me as we dive into everything LGBTQIA+. From rights to culture, health, and events, we cover it all. Pride isn't just a June thing. It's year-round, and so is our show. Whether you're a part of the queer family or an ally, this is your space. Tune in to Twin Cities Pride Amplified every Saturday at 3 p.m. on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. It's an absolute must for any true foodie. Vinaigrette at 50th and Xerxes in South Minneapolis offers premium oils and vinegars for the most discriminating of tastes. This is Sarah Piepenberg, owner of Vinaigrette. We bottle on site, there's no guesswork, and you get to taste test each and every oil and vinegar we offer. Our direct relationship with the growers ensures an uncompromised level of satisfaction. When you need to know you're cooking with the finest ingredients, first contact the independently owned Vinaigrette, 50th and Xerxes in South Minneapolis. Online at vinaigrettemn.com. Toad, your alarm clock is ringing. It's spring. It's spring? Yes. Ding, ding, a ling, ding, a ling. Is it spring? Is it true? <laughs> you know what that means? I do. It means our show, A Year with Frog and Toad, is playing at Children's Theater Company. I can't wait for everyone to come see us live on stage. What do you think we should do? Well, we'll go swimming, bake cookies, cookies, cookies. And of course, we'll also sing. This is a musical, after all. Don't miss A Year with Frog and Toad, playing April 23rd through June 16th. Tickets at childrenstheater.org. It's the Matt McNeil Show. Got to give Hal Sparks credit. He posted this. Uh, this is Mike Crispy, uh, C-R-I-S-P-I. Uh, he's a host on Rumble Video. And yeah, I, never mind. He is the founder of, um, I guess, uh, he's a businessman. He's a New Jersey Trump delegate. This is what he posted on March 26. Liquidated my entire portfolio and put it into Don- Donald J. Trump's stock. You didn't? Stay poor, liberals. (laughs) Let me me pull up the Donald J. Trump stock from, what was it on the 26th of, of, oh, God, we're going to be right around here. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, um, that was the 25th was, oh, God, he got slaughtered on the 26th the close was 66 depending on when he bought it during the day the high that day was 70 basically 72 and now it's 23 or 22 22 genius mr crispy which by the way describes your your financial future uh torch it baby burn 952-946-6205 someone sent me this story because once again I'm going to say this. There are a lot of great cops out there. There are. But the problem is, is that there are, there are unfortunately quite a few who are not so great. And until the police themselves police this stuff up, which it sounds like they're doing now, that, that, you know, this is, this is why people, you know, there are people out there that don't trust the police. South Carolina police officer was charged with murder on Wednesday in the fatal shooting of a man who authorities say was trying to drive away after the two fought outside of a Chick-fil-A restaurant in Somerville. Somerville police officer Anthony DeLustro, 64, was off duty on March 20th when he shot 39-year-old Michael O'Neill in the parking lot after a physical confrontation between the men. Witnesses say DeLustro started the fight according to an arrest warrant attached to the news release. Do you want to do this? O'Neill said to Delustro. Once again, Delustro is the 64 year old cop off duty. O'Neill said several times, uh, witnesses told investigators, according to the warrant, he responded by saying, come on, addressing O'Neill with a gay slur. So this is the cop off duty instigated the fight completely. Both men got out of their cars and exchanged kicks and punches as bystanders tried to intervene. The warrant says 
It's unclear what provoked the fight. Delustro then told O'Neill he was under arrest after. So he starts the fight with this guy. The guy's like, are you sure you want to do this? He says, let's fight. Basically, then after when it sounds like he's starting to lose, that's when all of a sudden the badge comes out, which he's off duty, by the way. During the scuffle, Delustro's handgun fell from its holster to the ground. Responsible gun ownership. Dear Lord. That's when O'Neill said he was leaving and headed to his car. So basically, he's walking away. Delustro's wife, she sounds like a gem, who reportedly had tried to restrain O'Neill during the fight, so basically she's trying to grab him as her husband's trying to hit him, also attempted to block him from getting into his car, witnesses said. So the guy's trying to leave. Delustro picks up his handgun, got in the passenger passenger side of O'Neill's car, and shot him as O'Neill tried to drive away, according to the warrant. So he basically jumps in. The guy is trying to leave. Once again, the cop starts the fight. This guy basically, when the gun falls on the ground, he's like, okay, I'm done here. I'm leaving. His wife basically tries to stop him. He gets in the car, and he's getting ready to leave, and the cop jumps in the car and shoots him as he's trying to leave. Berkeley County Coroner Daryl Hartwell said the bullet entered O'Neill's right arm, traveled through his chest, killing him instantly. Delustro told investigators that he acted in self-defense. Something tells me booze was involved with this. And shot O'Neill because he thought his legs were trapped under the car. But witness accounts in bystanders' videos did not corroborate Delustro's claims that he feared for his safety of his wife and the community. Investigators said... In an interview after the shooting, Delustro acknowledged uh, that he knew O'Neill was trying to leave and that he never saw him with a weapon or heard him threaten to use one. Delustro was an officer with the New York Police Department from 1980 to 2003. When he retired before a review board investigated a complaint against him, the Post and Courier in Charleston reported he had been cleared two previous misconduct accusations. In a video call from jail Wednesday, Delustro told the judge that he had dedicated his life to public service and was Ground zero. And he shot and killed this guy. Well, no, he didn't say that. I'm adding that part because you know, it's like, I was a hero on 9-11. Screw you. Uh, after the terrorist attacks in the World Trade Center, he did not address the shooting, but the, asked the judge for mercy so he could help his wife with raising their two granddaughters whose mother died in 2021. Now, mind you, the wife was trying to restrain O'Neill and try to stop him from leaving. She's not off the hook here either. Um, a GoFundMe campaign for the raised parent and money for his parents, O'Neill's cousin, Amy Nail, said that his father had been a police officer in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for more than 30 years. This is a family that has a great deal of respect for law enforcement in general, yet it is fully aware that no profession is free of bad actors. Good for you. Solicitor uh, Scarlett Wilson, whose ninth judicial court circuit court office is prosecuting case, said in a statement Wednesday, they thought our prayers with O'Neill's family and praised witnesses for coming forward. It's a very difficult time, but they have acted and reacted with dignity and grace. Delustro is being held without bond in the Berkeley County Detention Center. No date has been set for his next court hearing. He murdered that guy. And I often have said, and, and now it, this is not the similar case. I mean, in this case, a lot of witnesses came forward and said the truth and told what exactly happened, that Delustro was evil. But I have often said, the way that the laws are written in many states, you could have an off-duty cop at a bar, drunk as a skunk, say, I gotta go get my gun and shut up. Get in his car, drive drunk home, get his gun, drive drunk back to the bar, and basically, as long as he says, I was scared right before he shot the guy in many states, he's going to get away with it. Now, the difference here is that this guy, there were plenty of witnesses that said, no, he wasn't scared. He was the agitator. He was the guy that went chasing after the guy when he was trying to leave. He jumped in his car and killed him in cold blood. Do they have the death penalty in South Carolina? Hey, I'm not for the death penalty, but be interesting to see if they do. Chicago, have a good one. We're back tomorrow to Minneapolis, St. Paul, hour two up next. Tune in this Saturday morning right here on AM 950 for the Guardian with Joy and Holly radio show from 7 to 8 a.m. 
We'll be discussing what practical gardening is and how it applies to your garden, as well as good mulches and bad mulches. Our guest is host and author of PBS's Growing a Greener World. Joe Lampa will be with us and will answer your garden questions. That's all this Saturday morning from 7 to 8 a.m. right here on AM 950. Tell a friend and let's grow together. Hi, I'm Kelly Kirk. I'm Chad Larson. And I'm Joe Kirk. Your hosts for Searching for Service. Tune in to Rotary's influential show and podcast, sharing touching stories of service locally and abroad. We bring you weekly guests that connect, inform, and inspire our listeners on all things service. We highlight diverse service opportunities that appeal to both Rotarians and people driven to serve in their communities. Tune in Sundays at 3 p.m. or anytime via podcast. It's time to stop searching and start serving. The Tom Hartman Show. Now, that's Smart Radio, AM 950, KTNF, St. Louis Park, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the progressive voice of Minnesota. AP News. I'm Ed Donahue. Stocks finished the day mixed. The Dow was higher. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said in Washington today, persistently elevated inflation will likely delay any Fed interest rate cuts until later in the year. They were hoping for June. That opens the door to a period of higher for longer rates. House Speaker Mike Johnson is pushing for more U.S. aid for Ukraine and Israel, despite Republican anger. Here's the AP Sagar Magani. Johnson's thin Republican majority is again sending the aid, which would force him to rely on Democrats to help pass it. Kentucky's Thomas Massey says he's had enough. We need a speaker who is not doing everything Chuck Schumer wants. Republicans in the room during a private meeting this morning say Massey suggested Johnson should resign or risk a vote to oust him. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is in my view, an absurd notion. Johnson says he knew it would be a tough job. I regard myself as a as a wartime speaker and says he will move forward with votes to send aid to Ukraine, Israel and other allies, though his multi-part plan leaves out a key GOP priority, southern border security. Sagar Megani, Washington. The Supreme Court heard arguments over the charge of obstruction of an official proceeding and whether it can be used against more than 300 people who are charged in connection with the Capitol riot comes from a law passed in the aftermath of the Enron financial scandal. Defendant attorney Jeffrey Green told the justices it shouldn't be used. Attempting to stop a vote count or something like that is a very different act than actually changing a document or altering a document. Former President Donald Trump is facing two charges from special counsel Jack Smith in Washington that could be knocked out with a favorable ruling from the Supreme Court. This is AP News. Retired or retiring soon? How much money do you need to live comfortably? Retirement Planners of America is here for you. Would you like to have financial peace of mind? Here's how. Step one, find out the amount of money you'll need to retire. Step two, have a plan to get there. Step three, make sure that plan can take advantage of market gains but protect you from market losses. Discover how to do all three with a free consultation at 800-508-6108. That's 800-508-6108. All investments involve risk, including losses. Past performance does not guarantee future results. He loves to sniff the neighborhood dogs a little too closely. On more than one occasion, you've seen him roll around in the mud. He's been known to drool a bit more than normal especially when he's excited and you heard him cleaning himself less than an hour ago yet here you are letting him lick your face for a really 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 long time we get it you love him unconditionally that's why pets best has customizable affordable pet insurance plans so you can protect the love of your life get peace of mind in a quote today at petsbest.com turn to auto technical with your vehicle donation even though auto technical is a small nonprofit, we have helped more families with transportation than any organization in Minnesota. Since 94, we have reconditioned donated vehicles so they have a higher tax benefit. Call Richard at 612-919-5526, 612-919-5526, or autotech.org. What's up, pet pals? Coming up on Arden Moore's Four-Legged Life show this week, we talk with a team using AI, artificial intelligence, for dog training. 
And then we spotlight a very special dog named Molly, who is bringing smiles to people coping with cancer. Be sure to tune in. Catch Arden Moore's four-legged furry life every Sunday at 5 p.m. on AM 950. You want to feel important. You want to be part of something bigger, something that matters and that you can help change things. You want to feel like you belong. We felt that way too. I'm Sergeant Michael Tislin from Chaska, Minnesota, and that's why we did something about it. We aren't just Minnesota Army National Guard soldiers. We are people just like you, and together we can make a difference. Take on your legacy. Visit nationalguard.com forward slash MN to find out more. Sponsored by the Minnesota Army National Guard, aired by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association and this station. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for showers and storms today with a high near 60. Tonight, rain with a low around 49. And Wednesday, more rain with a high around 56. Spring has arrived and it's time to take a good look at your lawn. If there's bare spots or brown patches, Natural Lawn can help. For over 30 years, Natural Lawn has taken an environmentally friendly approach to lawn care to feed your soil without unnecessary chemicals. Beat the summer rush and visit NaturalLawn.com. That's NaturalLawn.com. Portions of the following program may be pre-recorded. Hour number two of the show here on your Tuesday. Matt and Brett here today. Brett, I'm going to ask you the same thing I started off the three o'clock hour with, because this is a legit question here, because I think technology moves in a very you know, rapid pace. Does it ever? Yes. yes. Uh, so I've got a, um, I've got a, I had an old computer. It's gone now. It was an iMac. That was seven years old. It just sat in my basement. There was a, there was a, my wife's company had a, a, a tech, you know, recycling day. And for all the other stuff, you know, you could, you know, we could wipe it clean. We couldn't even get this thing started. I mean, it had mildew, oh, on, no. it. It had mildew <laughs> on it. It was, it was not even starting. It wasn't any doing anything. And so I, we, we had a discussion about whether or not seven years. Okay. So first of all, anything from seven years ago, all those passwords have been long updated. And most of the stuff now today is two-factor author, uh, reauthorization. So if, if I even want to go to like Xfinity, if I want to just ask Xfinity a question, which my bill is going to be for the month, I have to have it two-factored authentication. So I'm not sure necessarily there's any passwords or anything on there that are, you know, uh -oh, we're in trouble here. But do, do you think today that there are people that would get a computer that, especially one that's not really working, and take the 20, 30 hours to get the thing operating again, just to hope there's something. It seems to me that today, the modern day person, if they're trying to rip you off, they're just ripping you off over the, the uh, Wi-Fi or whatever it is. They're just getting access to your cloud or something. Yeah, that's a good point because uh, at least when I'm going to dispose of a computer, I would probably try to wipe that thing clean just for that very reason. Because even yeah. though, as you said, I mean, it could take some time. I don't want to take that risk. There's personal information on there. So I side towards a little more safety when I'm disposing of those just to well, wipe those things clean. But you're probably right that we're much more likely to get those scams through the phone or through like a phishing email or some weird social media message that might dupe you. That's where I think we're, you're probably right where we're more likely to get, well, get fraud that way. If I was going to steal the computer, wouldn't you, wouldn't your better bet? I mean, if you're looking and Patrick brought this point up and I thought this was an excellent point, Patrick, that if you're looking for a quick return around, you just sell the parts or the metals or whatever the yeah. things in the computer that's going to get you some money quick, as opposed to having to give a tech guy that has all the stuff to access a seven-year-old computer and be able to hope that any passwords or anything are still good. Yeah, you're probably right. They, yeah, you're much more likely to get that through parts unless like you're Hunter Biden or someone and they're going to be just trying to take apart your computer and getting whatever's on there. Well, it, it, it also should be mentioned that it did, uh, you know, Hunter Biden, it didn't really work for them either on that. No, one, no. So. Yeah, that's right. They didn't really even get much from that, did they? No. Uh, um, the I, I, I want to as well bring up, I know this is something you're going to talk a little bit with with uh, Cooligan here because we've got Patrick Cooligan coming in from the Minnesota Reformer. I have to admit I am somewhat concerned when up in Senate District 12, there's a guy here who has convicted of secondary felony assault Um that the DFL endorsed him for the, the the office. I mean, it, it, okay. So can I just say, I am seeing the DFL fall back into their bad pattern of ignoring the outstate districts. The last two re years, the reason why they have done so well, I've actually, I could make an argument even the last four years, the last four election cycles, I should say, is because 2018, 2020, 2022, I should say those three, they focused and they had good candidates in every race, even races, which were say plus 20 Republican. And this time around, 
I don't think the DFL in St. Paul is caring that much about these outstate races. And proof of that to me seems to be that no one screened this candidate for a, a, a Senate uh, district um, that, that, you know, that it's going to run for a house race. It's in the Senate district 12 area. You got the endorsement there, but it's a house race, but still, I mean, I don't understand how in the world you didn't do basic diligence there. And I think for me, at least, that screams to me that the DFL is not doing the damn job right now. And we brought up in our conversation with Patrick, we'll get into more detail on this, that uh, it could be the case that nobody else was running in that seat. But even with that, though, he's got quite the rap sheet where you sh still should be able to figure out that this guy is probably bad news, where um, I have to imagine he might be known by some members of that community that uh, he's more than a little unbalanced because I'm with you. This uh it's a concerning trend to have someone like this get the endorsement and kind of be the face of that party in that district when you don't want them to to it, really be that when we when we'll get into some of these uh, rap sheet things that he's been into over the past few years. The, the, if your if your party doesn't have a process for this, yeah. just for that exact scenario. So you're in a you're in a plus 35 Republican district. No Democrat wants to run this year. Fine. You should have a process in place. To where if some guy who's got a rap sheet that's pretty extensive says, well, I'll be the Democratic candidate, they say, no, I'm sorry that you're not. That's not an option. I would I would make an argument that if you don't have that you know, language in place, you need to have that language in place because shrugging your shoulders and say, what can we do? Well, you can make sure the guy with the big rap sheet's not your guy out there because although I don't think this is going to sway the election one way or the other, it sure is giving the right a lot of chuckles that you basically were dumb enough. To, the Democratic, the DFL in the state was dumb enough to allow that to happen. And and I'll be the first to say it. How, how can you be that dumb? I mean, you're not paying attention to what's going on. And I can point a lot to the Senate District 12 that no one called down to, to Ken Martin or anything. I'm going to presume no one called down there and said, you, we got a problem up here. But you, the fact that this is happening, you know, you're, you're being reactionary as opposed to you know, um, you know, being proactive is that's a huge, this is a bad sign. I think that the DFL is falling into their bad, their old bad habits. Yeah. And you just, even as simple as a Google search probably would have turned up some information on this guy, I would guess. Google search, <laughs> you know, the, the St. Paul business journal, they needed to do a business, a Google search on their MS, you know, BJ logo, because I got to told you from the get go, oh, the you <laughs> don't want to do that there, Minneapolis St. Paul business journal. <laughs> It's like I said, the the uh, the the better the better business community. Uh, the, you, you learn your lesson. Don't go with that. But needless to say, no, I, I agree with you. I, I think that yeah, I'm really concerned. That, that I mean, the reason why you have both houses and the House and the Senate and the governor's office is because you took every race seriously. And yeah, we have Anita Gall who came on, who ran out in that district, and she was, you know, outmanned, now gunned out of th that district. But you still, they had to put effort and time into that. And if there's a whole bunch of these districts where they're not even paying attention to who's running, come on, you got, you can't, you can't, you can't be basically running in a statewide campaign where it's okay. We're going to lose some seats, where, especially when Republicans are in, in uh, the ones out in the East Metro District, down the South District. They've got some clown car candidates that have won these oh, endorsements. Yeah. So I, I just think that it's, I, I, I just think you need a better statewide game plan. And I'm not saying that's not a lot of work, but well, that's your job. You're the party. And there's one silver lining. At least this was uncovered now, because could you imagine if this was a story last week of October, look at who the DFL nominated to run for the state legislature. Are all the DFL candidates like this? Do they endorse this guy. When Broadcourt brought the story up, because he was the one that really broke it. When Broadcourt brought the story up, I said, I don't think it was him because Mary Franson was the one that initially ran with it because of this. You're exactly right. They should have sat on this. They should have sat on this because clearly the, the DFL was asleep at the wheel. They should have sat on this, waited till early October, and then said, what are you guys doing? Because then, then they really, that would have had some impact. This will be gone out of the news cycle before May 1st. Yeah, you could picture those questions. Are you going to endorse Machete Guy? We'll get into why we're calling Machete Guy in the article. <laughs> He's comes. Machete Guy. He's Machete Guy. We'll get to that. Yeah. So what else are you in? Uh, you're going to talk about this story. What else are you in? Yeah, Patrick we'll Cook also guy? briefly touch on this. Uh, speaking of uh, 
people who are a little bit on the fringe of candidates, we'll talk about this guy that got the endorsement in Farmington that's running in Pat Garofalo's old seat because he's got quite the rap sheet as well. And besides that, uh, we're talking about a bill at the legislature that looks like it won't become law that has to do with uh, allowing cities to tax Internet service companies because that could uh, help fund many public projects and help city coffers as well. So lots to talk about in the legislature and some of these candidates with Kulikan. One quick little note about the candidate down in uh, Garofalo seat, which is 58B. The Minnesota GOP must be so scared of this guy. They are still listing Garofalo as the candidate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just never updated the website. Uh, it's like a news for you. He's not going to be the candidate this year. So who's exactly running down there? We'll have to find out. Patrick Cool again with Brett right here on AM 950. AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Brett Johnson with you here on a Tuesday afternoon. And as usual on Tuesdays, we are joined by the editor-in-chief of the Minnesota Reformer. That's Patrick Kulikan. And make sure you go to minnesotareformer.com for the latest in Minnesota news and politics. As today, we are going to be talking about some news from the state legislature and also taking a look at some candidates who are running for the legislature this fall. We are going to be talking about this broadband bill that's being debated in the Minnesota House because it would allow uh, potentially cities to tax Internet providers and do things like fund public access and the streaming of city council and school board meetings. Very progressive sounding bill, but unfortunately, it looks like it might not become a reality. We're going to be chatting about why that's the case. Plus, we'll also be talking about some fringe candidates running from the running for the state legislature throughout Minnesota. So, Patrick, thanks so much for coming back on the show today. Always a pleasure. All right, let's start off talking about what's going on in the state legislature, because you might be familiar with how oftentimes cable companies have to pay a franchise fee to local cities in order to operate. And the money that are used from these franchise fees is used to fund things like public access or broadcasting of city council and school board meetings. Very common for many cities to do this to tax cable providers to then go back and invest that money into the city. But as people continue to cut cable, cities are struggling to pay for their public programming. So the Minnesota House had an idea of trying to fix this which would allow cities to charge broadband service providers a fee to place internet lines in their jurisdictions, which would be up to 8% of the provider's gross revenue. Now, from that money that cities could potentially collect, about two-thirds of it, they'd be free to spend pretty much however they want, while while the other one-third would be used for government media programming and broadcasting things like city council and school board meetings. A also would have allowed cities to negotiate with broadband companies to ensure equal broadband access within their communities. So overall, sounds like originally a pretty progressive bill, but it's hit some roadblocks in the state legislature. So, Patrick, can you fill us in on what happened with this bill on the possibly allowing local cities to tax broadband providers? Because it looks like there was a lot of good things in the bill, but uh, now it looks like at least for this session, it's not going to be a reality. Yeah, it hit some blowback. It was going to hit the House uh, as part of a larger omnibus bill, and then they stripped it out, uh, I think, yesterday. And I think the uh, the, the obvious reason is that uh, the DFL did not want to be taxing people's Internet service uh, in, in an election year. Uh, that's that's my own interpretation. I'm sure they would tell you something different. In fact, uh, the the commerce chairman Zach Stevenson says, "Well, it's a decent idea, but we got to work work out some of the kinks, and we'll come back in future years." Uh, it seemed like a, a good way to uh, raise revenue for give local cities um, a, a chance to raise revenue, um, and uh, which would compensate them. Uh, for some of the right of way management when they lay this cable down that can create a mess. And I think there's some concern that um, there's the cities don't have enough money to um, fix the, the right of ways uh, after the cable goes down. Uh, but mostly it was a chance for local governments to, to raise revenue um, and maybe rely less on uh, property taxes. Uh, and then, as you said, uh, a chance to negotiate with uh, with the broadband companies uh, to to try to make sure that everybody has access. Uh, but this is um, interesting to me, um, mostly because it's just kind of another example of how this session is so much different than last year. And last year, uh, I think uh, most people would agree was one of the most monumental 
sessions uh, uh, in decades, and it seemed like uh, every time you turned around, they were enacting a huge um, change in law or program from legalizing cannabis uh, to a, a paid leave program. Um, obviously, the, the budget was filled with all kinds of um, important uh, policy uh, and progressive policy in particular. I mean, there was gun control. There was the PRO Act, which codified abortion rights. Um, on and on and on. This year, we're just not seeing that. Um, I think there is a recognition, even by some of the most progressive members, that uh, this House majority, it's the House that's on the on the ballot this fall, not the Senate, but this House majority at 70-64, depending on how the national election goes, they're, a little, they're pretty nervous, I think, about some of these edge seats in the suburbs and in greater Minnesota. And um, I think they're they're trying to make sure they insulate themselves from issues that could be used against them. And I think, uh, you know, the DFL wants to tax your internet is a pretty easy one. Um, it sits on a on a postcard or a piece of mail. Um, digital ads uh, would be easy. You know, they could do it easily with digital ads as well. Uh, so it fits a pa- a pattern uh, that we've seen this session where even when they've Propose some ambitious programs or uh, policies, they've uh, stepped back um, and uh, they're just going to, uh, I think, try to maintain their majority, maybe expand it, and then come back next year. And going back to the idea of the using this broadband issue for Republicans as a potential wedge issue, yeah, that very much does fit in a broadband or fit on a bumper sticker that the DFL wants to tax your internet because even though the tax is technically on the internet service providers, uh, very likely that they would pass those costs along to consumers. In fact, uh, reading through the article that Michelle wrote, uh, the internet service providers even pretty much admitted that that would be the case if this fee were to go through, even though, well, it's not, at least for this session. But going back to your point, talking about the idea that maybe this session hasn't been quite as productive as last year, is this pretty much just the idea that uh, DFLers are nervous about this year's fall election? I know there was recently a KSTP poll which showed that the race between DFL and Republican and Republicans, at least on a generic ballot for the legislature, was pretty much neck and neck, although I don't know if I put a ton of stock into that this early and the fact that the legislature is probably going to be tied more to the presidential election. But would many of these bills that they're proposing now, whether it's this taxing Internet service providers or criminal justice reform, or even as we talked about last week, land use reform, which could have allowed more cities to build affordable housing, are these more likely to pass maybe in a future session? And is this entirely related to the fact that this is a, that this is well an election year and also kind of a bonding year as well. Uh, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on this and whether these bills have hopes for the future or, uh, or are these pretty much just kind of dead the rest of the way as we go? Yeah, I think it's, it's important for people to realize who, who are not at the Capitol year after year or following it. Like I am that it's often the case that, major policy takes several years to pass. Um, and it's actually, even if something dies, that doesn't mean in the, in the legislative sense, that doesn't mean it's, it's dead forever. Um, often it's a, it's a good exercise for the advocates uh, to work um, with their allies, uh, hone their media message, um, talk to lawmakers about the bill and why they think it's important. Uh, and so it's, it's not uncommon for uh, legislation to take several years to come to fruition. Certainly this was, even all the stuff last year, I think a lot of people were taken by surprise by some of the, some of the uh, legislative victories. But the Minnesota uh, House uh, had passed a lot of it in previous years when it was controlled by the, the Democrats. It just didn't go anywhere in the Senate because it had been controlled by Republicans. But that exercise... Um, and, and sometimes it seemed like a futile exercise because they, they knew once it hit that Republican Senate, it wasn't going to go anywhere. But you do it anyway because, uh, again, you, you hone that message, you, you hear the opposition arguments so you can uh, prepare yourself either by making changes to the law or to the bills or um, making changes to your, uh, your message. Um, so all that is helpful. So even though the 
uh, I think when, when all is said and done, they're not going to have a long list of accomplishments this session. Um, that doesn't mean that all of it was uh, for naught. Um, it, it is important uh, to do the work, even if you don't get it across the finish line. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, especially considering all of the accomplishments that were uh, put into stone last year uh, and the fact that this is an election year and typically a bonding year where we don't see the big policy changes that you uh, see uh, during a during a non-election year cycle. You can read more about what Michelle wrote on this uh, broadband piece over at minnesotareformer.com, minnesotareformer.com. Uh, sticking on the topic of the state legislature, got to talk about this because the DFL state party has disavowed a local party unit's endorsement of a guy named Judd Hoff, who is running to unseat longtime Representative Mary Franzen, who is a Republican from the Alexandria area in District 12B. Now, you might be asking, why would the DFL be endorsing a uh, candidate who was, well, previously having the DFL endorsement? Well, there's a laundry list of reasons why this happened. Hoff was convicted of second-degree assault uh, felony back in 2021. Charges came after a confrontation with a man who angrily stole an American flag that Hoff displayed upside down in his car. Hoff sought to retrieve the flag with the help of a 23-inch blade. Then Republican Representative John Heintzman says that for years, uh, this guy Hoff has stalked Representative Mary Franzen by digging through her trash, publishing her address and contact information, filming her at private residences, and relentlessly sending rude and threatening messages online. So as you can see, uh, not too surprising that the DFL decided to disavow this guy and disavow their endorsement. But I think the bigger thing that comes out of this is that really, if you look at Mary Franzen's seat, it's heavily Republican, something like 70-30 or perhaps even more. So it's already very difficult to try to convince anyone who's a Democrat or even left-leaning to run in that district. And I think this kind of shows oftentimes that, well, if nobody's going to run, anybody who does decide to run has a good chance of getting that endorsement, kind of no matter their background. And that certainly is the case in this district. And we see this kind of all over the state and the country. When you have some of these non-competitive races, you can get some, well, controversial people who are running on the opposition party when you don't have anyone else who's really interested in trying to win what's thought to be an unwinnable fight. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a really frightening situation. He, he he appears to have bought a house across the street from her um, for the sole purpose of uh, harassing and stalking her. And, uh, I mean, you mentioned the uh, going through her trash and all that. And then he's got these, uh, unrelated to France, but he's got this second-degree assault. It was another case in which he wielded his machete, um, and he was ultimately not charged. Um, but um, to, to me, the problem is, I mean, you have the uncompetitive races, but uh, the situation where the party endorses someone uh, is a little unusual, I think. it's. Um, I've worked in other states. We didn't have this situation. Uh, and I think, I mean, I, I just don't know why we engage in this. I mean, I, I know there's some... Um, some Minnesotans who who will uh, instruct me in why the endorsement process is so important, but I, I don't understand the value, um, especially in a case like this, um, because you wind up endorsing some uh, pretty terrible people, as happened here. It also happened, uh, by the way, on Saturday, uh, in a Republican district in uh, Farmington, where they they have an open seat there because uh, the Republican Pat Garofalo is not running again, and they endorsed a guy there who uh, is an election denier and kind of a 2020 uh, election conspiracy theorist. Who he went to the house of a he was trying to stop a, an election and and was serving a, a city councilwoman uh, with court papers and went to her home to do so. There was no reason to do that. He went to her home three times in one day. It led to an altercation. Um, so this the endorsement process, because, uh, I mean, I don't think that's what happened in the case of Hoff. I mean, I think he, I'm sure it's just like, like you said, it's a 70-30 district or whatever. It's like, hey, anybody want to run against uh, friends and okay, I will. Okay. And then they all just endorsed. Um, 
But the other problem with the, the endorsement process is the people most engaged, um, uh, as, as a, as a lawmaker told me last week, the problem is that the people most engaged are the weirdest because <laughs> they're the only ones willing to go to some, you know, sit inside, uh, some gymnasium on a Saturday when it's 70 degrees out in April and sit there for eight or 10 hours and, you know, grind out this endorsement. And I, I, I shouldn't castigate the people who are, um, heroically, civically engaged. I, I, we appreciate that. We appreciate their efforts. Um, but this is a downside of this process. You get these really hardened partisans slash people with nothing better to do. Um, it could be either or, or both. And, and they're the ones who are picking who the party ultimately endorses. And then the endorsement, of course, that, but then it's confusing to the average person because if you win the endorsement, that does not mean you're the party nominee. You have to actually win the primary, but the party uh, will help the, will only help the endorsed candidate in the primary. Uh, Democratic voters have been smarter on this. Democrats have not uh, nominated a an endorsed candidate for governor since Wendell Anderson, um, back in the seventies, right? Yeah. Uh, Seventy two, I think, and uh, or seventy was it? I'm sorry, uh, a long time ago, essentially. Where, yeah, right, half a century. And Repu- but Republicans continue to follow the endorsement. If if you win the endorsement, you're very likely to win. Uh, the primary, the, the endorsement still carries a lot of weight on the Republican side. And, um, you know, it, the, the process, uh, the, the party leaders will tell you it encourages participation and grassroots activism. And that's something that we have a lot of in Minnesota compared to other states. And maybe the endorsement process is, is the cause of that. I'm not really so sure of that. Um, but you, you do wind up with some real bad candidates getting endorsed. Um, and that's certainly the case here with Hoff. Um, it sounds like he's very unbalanced. Um, and, and we certainly, uh, as much as we often disagree, uh, with Mary Franson, um, nobody should be subjected to to what uh, she's had to endure, uh, from this guy. So hopefully that there's a local party unit, which is the one who can withdraw that endorsement. Hopefully they will do so quickly. And, um, and certainly um, and move on from this. Yeah, as you said, Mary Franzen, certainly not my favorite legislature, but uh, yeah, that's a little weird to have someone moving across the street from you just to essentially harass you. Yeah, don't wish that on anyone. Uh, do want to quickly just talk about this uh, endorsement. This is unrelated, that endorsement contest you mentioned down in Farmington in what's now going to be Pat Garofalo's old seat, because unlike this Mary Franzen seat, which we said is 70 30 or perhaps even more heavily republican than that pat garofalo's seat is much closer to being a 50 50 divide between dflers and republicans so if this guy that they endorsed down in farmington for the republican uh for the republican party ends up being the nominee for the fall election that could cause some massive problems that potentially be a dfl flip i think this is a suddenly becomes a much more competitive seat uh, I think this guy uh, that they've endorsed, uh, there's there's some red flags there, um, and you're going to see uh, more research appearing. And as you say, uh, generally a Republican area, but has become uh, more Democratic. That Senate district down there, the DFL did win the Senate district um, in 2016. Um, and so, uh, before losing it in 20, but I, I think it's possible that it was flipped all Lakeville's also had, uh, or Lakeville Farmington, that area has had a lot of growth and, you know, you could have, um, I'm speculating here, but you could have city people having moved down there. They may have, you know, more liberal value. And so, um, yeah, I think like a good candidate on the DFL side, uh, could potentially, at least for a term, um, turn that district blue, and that's a big headache uh, for Republicans trying to win the majority. 
Yeah, absolutely. Since they're already behind the eight ball trailing 70 to 64 in terms of the seat breakdown. Yeah, lose another one to the DFL. Well, that's another seat Republicans would have to flip in order to gain the majority. Uh, you can read more about what we were talking about on this guy, Hoff, Judd Hoff, who is running in Mary Franzen's district, at least for now, over at minnesotareformer.com, along with Patrick's column on this. Again, minnesotareformer.com. We have been speaking with Patrick Kulikan, who is the editor-in-chief of the Minnesota Reformer. Again, a tremendous resource for finding the latest in Minnesota news and politics. Patrick, as always, thanks for coming on the show today. Always a pleasure, Brett. All right, let's take a break and send things back over to Matt McNeil on AM 950. This is Chad, owner of AM 950. After the hail storm last year, we had a number of people stop by the station letting us know we had damage. That's when I call our trusted contractor, Snap Construction. Turns out we didn't have any damage and our roof was still in good health. Ryan, is it common to hear you have damage when you don't? Chad, this can happen more times than not. At Snap Construction, we'll give you a thorough assessment and let you know the condition of your roof. We are trusted by a number of insurance agents in the Metro to give them just that, an honest assessment. Last year's storm is just starting to reveal damage on homes that didn't show damage last year. If you were in the path of a storm and were denied, it's worth an extra look. Freezing, thawing conditions and spring rains will wash away the damaged granules that are covering up damage from last year's storm. Call Snap Construction, arguably the most well-reviewed exterior contractor in the metro area at 612-333-SNAP or find them online at snapconstruction.com. Now at Woodland Stoves and Fireplaces, the Morso Wood Stoves qualify for a 30% tax credit. Morso Wood Stoves earned the Nordic Swan Eco Label, Europe's most rigorous environmental standard. Here in the U.S., these Morso Wood Stoves qualify for the 30% federal tax credit. This is a credit of up to $2,000 off your income tax when you install efficient wood heating. Morso Wood Stoves are known for elegant Danish design, made of quality cast iron. This is furniture that radiates heat and warmth. Morso brings the tradition of wood heating into the 21st century. Woodland Stoves and Fireplaces has been selling wood burning products since 1977. Morso is an important part of our diverse selection of fireplace products. We want to make fire work for you. Let us show you how Morso wood burning stoves can work in your home. Get in touch with the folks at Woodland Stoves and Fireplaces. They are the chimney and installation experts. Woodland Stoves and Fireplaces has over 35 working wood, gas, and electric units on display at the corner of East Franklin and Riverside Avenue in Minneapolis. Hi, I'm Scott Shamblot from Shamblot Family Dentistry. We're the fear-free, shame-free dental office. If you're having a dental emergency, we'll try and get you in the same day you call because we don't like to see anyone in pain. And we'll help you get through every appointment in the most pain-free way possible. As my daughter Rachel says, If you don't see my dad, please see another dentist. Take care of your teeth because they're the only ones you get. Shamblot Family Dentistry in Hopkins and St. Paul. Find them online at shamblotfamilydentistry.com or call 1-800-FIX-MY-TEETH. Chanhassen Dinner Theaters brings you the Tony and Grammy award-winning smash hit, Beautiful, the Carol King Musical. I feel the earth move. Carol wrote hit songs for famous recording groups of the era like the Shirelles, the Drifters, and Little Eva. Come on, baby, do the love promotion. You'll see them all in this big musical that's the inspiring true story of one woman's remarkable journey from teenage songwriter to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Feel like a natural Featuring a stunning array of beloved songs, including I Feel the Earth Move, You've Got a Friend, and It's Too Late. And it's too late, baby, now it's too late. This uplifting phenomenon takes you back to where it all began and on the song and dance ride of a lifetime. So beautiful, so beautiful, you're beautiful, so beautiful. Beautiful, the Carol King musical. Now playing on the main stage at Chan Hessen Dinner Theaters. Get your tickets today. Visit ChanHessenDT.com. Mental health and substance use disorders are complex, stigmatizing, and can be overwhelming issues for families to face. Finding the right diagnosis and care can sometimes feel impossible, especially when you don't know where to start looking. Hazelden Betty Ford understands what your family is going through. Hazelden Betty Ford's patient access team will direct you towards a clear path forward in network with most insurances. This message is brought to you by Hazelden Betty Ford, the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, and this station. 
With a look at your AM 950 weather, I'm Patrick Lilia. Showers and thunderstorms continue tonight with a low of 53. And Wednesday, another chance of rain with a high of 56. Spring is here and it's a good time to take a look at your lawn. If it's not the lush green lawn you're hoping for, Natural Lawn can help. Natural Lawn's organic approach is safe for people and pets. Don't wait for summer and visit naturallawn.com today. Matt McNeil Show. 952-946-6205. 952-946-6205. No, I am not exactly the biggest fan of Mary Franzen. Um, I think she is you know, said some amazingly ignorant things over the time, but she sure as heck doesn't deserve what Judd Hoff has done. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to go as far as saying, I I think maybe there should be, I have a question on whether there should be a mental health hold on Judd Hoff to evaluate where he is mentally, because it doesn't sound like he is. Yeah. I, I, I also want to make sure, because I I think if you go look at conservative social media, namely Twitter, and the comments they have made, they they basically have been very straightforward and very appreciative of the Democrats just calling outright that Hoff should be removed. As a matter of fact, and once again, I'm going to go even as far as to say there is a major failure within the Senate District 12 as well as within the state party, if a candidate this bad was able to get an endorsement. That tells me there's a lot of people asleep at the wheel. And we can point to Senate District 12 and their, you know, and, and the fact that, okay, so if it became clear there was not any real candidate and this guy came up, how in the world did you not contact Ken Martin and the DFL and say, we got a big problem up here. What's the process for not having an endorsement? But then as well, I'll even go on in further and criticize Ken Martin about it because I don't think right now the DFL party is doing what has had given them success the last three election cycles, which is caring about every single district that is out there. This guy should not be on the ballot. And as once again, I want to go even the further extent. He clearly needs, I think there needs to be some sort of mental health examination of this man to determine whether or not he is, it's safe for society for him to be out. Very clear. No one can question where I'm sitting here. I'm very absolute on this point. Now let's talk Drew Roach. Because... There, my guess is going to be is there's going to be a lot of Republicans who are going to be of the mindset, well, that's really different than Hoff. You don't want to do it. Now, reminder, if you're wondering, why does Drew Roach talk, sound familiar? I talked about him last week. Um, that We were talking about him last week in regards to... Um, you know, him running in a primary in Garofalo's seat. Um, Roach is seeking to replace Representative Patrick Garofalo, veteran Republican lawmaker who's not seeking re-election. Um, a retired, uh, you know, Sean McKnight was also running against in this seat along with Roach, Drew Roach. Roach is aligned with the election deniers that was involved in the lawsuit seeking to stop the 2020 primary election over technicalities. Uh, That's what brought him to Block's door. This is, he apparently tried to serve then Rosemount County City Council member Tammy Block with the court papers at her house. So once again, going to someone's house. He was trying to serve Block with papers notifying her of a petition against the city seeking to stop the upcoming primary elections, alleging the city failed to notify the public of upgrades to the electronic voting machine software. Roach and other activists believed the upgrades were tantamount to a new system should have triggered public comment period. Secretary of State Steve Simon said at the time the upgrades were akin to an iPhone update and did not require a public notice. The Secretary of State signed off on this, but the lawsuit was ultimately dismissed by the state Supreme Court, who basically, they lost, they lost again, and then they lost at the Supreme Court. 
Block told the police Roach and a woman showed up at her house three times that day. The third time, her 20-year-old son, Daniel Tesh, got into an altercation with Roach outside the house as four children watched from Roach's car, according to a police report. Tesh, Roach, and Block's fiance all ended up being charged with disorder, uh, disorderly conduct. Block called Roach a political extremist who resigned from the city council after the incident. Five police officers responded to a report of two people fighting in the street at about 8.50 p.m. Tesh told police he got in a fight with Roach because he was harassing his mother with three visits and aggressively pounding on the door. The third time, Block's fiance, Marco Ariaga, answered the door and the two exchanged words. Tesh heard the commotion and went outside, told police things turned physical after Roach said, I know where you live, blankety blank. So threats, intimidation, knocking on the door. Not to the extreme as Hoff, but still not good behavior. Roche told police he was trying to serve block court papers on behalf of fellow Patriot in Rosemount. Roach said Tesh got into his face, blocked him from leaving, and then threw him to the ground. They began tussling. Roach admitted that he punched Tesh after being put in a chokehold. You best believe I threw a punch. He's lucky it didn't get worse. So he's taunting and threatening other violence. All three men were charged with disorderly conduct and brawling while Tesh and Ariaga plead guilty and misdemeanor disorderly conduct charge. Roach refused to take the deal and was set to go to trial in the court when it was dismissed last fall. He told the reformer uh, that the criminal charges were complete politically motivated. So this is your guy. Should also be noted that the Star Tribune and Brianna Bierschbach in the morning hot dish talked about Roach. He also recently disrupted a Rice County public voting equipment test, shouting questions at local officials about cast vote records. Those records are digital recreations of voters' ballot choices, which conservative activists hope will provide the smoking gun to prove election fraud. Election experts have repeatedly debunked their claims. You guys are a bunch of freaking losers. Now, that being said, sore losers too, if I mind bad. Now, it's easy to sit there and claim, well, Judd is is worse. I'm, I, I, you know, that that Hoff is definitely a worse candidate, and 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 I think I was very clear. Is someone? I, I'm a little concerned about his mental health. And whether or not there should be a psychological hold on the guy to determine if he is a deed, a threat to the community. That's not a debate. I've, I've said that now multiple times this show. And I'm, I'm not, there's, there's no what about ism. I'm just basically saying, no, he's a bad guy. Hoff sounds like he, he shouldn't have gotten the nomination. I've criticized Senate district 12. I criticized the DFL as a whole. This should not be there. They should pull this back. End of story. And as much as I don't like Mary Franson, absolutely she does not deserve this kind of harassment. Anyone does. That being said, I don't hear a lot of Republicans upset about Drew Roach, even though he was going to people's house talking about, we know where you live, blankety blank. Talking about how he was getting ready to punch people. And it should be noted that indeed, according to a post from Eric Mortensen, that Eric Mortensen, Drew Roach is officially the endorsed candidate for 58B down in Garofalo's old seat. Actually, it's at 58, it's 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 at 58. It's not 58B, it's 58. He's the endorsed candidate for the state senate. Excuse me, it's the state house. Yeah, excuse me. It is 58B. He's the endorsed candidate for the state house down there this election cycle. Now, I think Brett brought up a very interesting point. The I, I don't think, you know, no one was going to question whether Mary Franson was going to win her seat again. That's that's it's a relatively safe seat for her. Although, once again, with since Roe v. Wade got overturned, we have seen a fairly substantial 
spin back to the Democratic side. So it might have been closer, but needless to say, that's over because, you know, the, the Democrats allowed the DFL allowed an absolute psychopath by the sounds of it to to basically get the, the nomination there. But that being said, it, this is this this is Farmington Lakeville seat. It's an interesting seat because when I started doing this radio show, that was a far right Republican territory. And trust me, I had a few go arounds with Garofalo on some of these right wing stances that he put forward. Now he sounds like one of the more moderate Republicans out there because he himself saw his district trending towards the the left. And that district is no longer, I, I would make an argument that's probably a toss up district right now. Now, I don't know if there's there's the endorsement. I don't know what the primary is going to do. I don't know if the Republicans are going to come back out there. There was once again a another candidate that the Republicans did indeed run um, to try to get the endorsement uh, and didn't win. Whether or not the primary comes out of it, I don't know. But I am going to be expecting a lot of the same Republicans who, in rightly so, rightly so, went after Hoff to also demand that Drew Roach be withdrawn in that district. I expect that because that's the standard, and it should be the standard. I'm not disagreeing with the standard. I'm not disagreeing with any element of this. Hoff was bad. He shouldn't have run. Let's talk about Drew Roach. And if you guys don't, well, that tells me a lot right there. 952-946-6205, 952-946-6205. We'll take a break. Come on back. It's the Matt McNeil Show right here on AM 950. I'm the host of Exploring Sovereignty with Elizabeth. In this radio show and podcast, we have conversations with heart-centered thought leaders to explore their pathway to becoming free, and we will shine a light on what has been hidden, often in plain sight, what they pay attention to, and how it has transformed them and others into a higher level thinking and feeling state during this time of great change. Explore being consciously aware, authentically free, and courageously sovereign with us Sundays at 11 a.m. on AM 950, and check out our early release episodes that drop Thursdays on your favorite podcast apps. The 2024 Consumer Reports Best Vehicle Edition is out, and once again, Toyotas from Rudy Luther Toyota dominate the field. Four Toyota models make their top picks for 2024, the Prius, the Camry Hybrid Prime, the RAV4 Prime, and the Highlander Hybrid. Consumer Reports recommends all the following Toyotas. The Prius, the Prius Prime, the Corolla, the Corolla Hybrid, the Camry, the Camry Hybrid, the Sienna, the Corolla Cross, the Corolla Cross Hybrid, the RAV4, the RAV4 Hybrid, the RAV4 Prime, the Highlander, and the Highlander Hybrid. See for yourself. Visit Rudy Luther Toyota and test drive one today, 394 and 169 in Golden Valley. The Park Tavern is your go-to destination for fun. Your friends and your family will have a great time with the fantastic food like the pizzas, appetizers, burgers, entrees, and sandwiches. The best bowling in Minnesota, the wildly popular outdoor patio, great drink specials, all the big games on their numerous screens, and it's the perfect place for your next private event. Even large gatherings for over 200. The Park Tavern is your go-to destination for everyone age 1 to 100. Come see for yourself. Have fun at the Park Tavern, Louisiana Avenue, north of Highway 7 in St. Louis Park. Hey, it's Patrick for Zero Res. I'm going to get right into it. You should call Zero Res to beat the spring cleaning rush with big savings and priority booking by calling our cleaning heroes today. You should think about the dust, dander, and bacteria that's been breeding in your carpet all winter long with nowhere to go. And don't forget about your air ducts. If they're dirty, your air quality suffers. Indoor air quality is an issue year-round, but all that pollen is getting ready to come out of hibernation and into your home. This month, get three rooms zero resified starting at just $129 and take $75 off any air duct cleaning. You owe it to yourself and your family to breathe happy, healthy, and clean. Call 952-ZERO-RES or go to ZeroResMinnesota.com and ask for the AM950 special. Zero res, backward or forward, spells the same. Oh, and by the way, someone also bringing up uh, Senate District 41, the two house races over there. Yeah, they that they, they got taken over by the far right too. And I, you know, I you know, 
that's a little, I mean, I think the, the, the one district I think is B the Southern part of that district. I think that that's going to be a very tough one for the Republicans to hold. If you've got a far right candidate, the North one, I don't know, but we'll, we, I, we'll have to see how that goes. Nine, five, two, nine, four, six, six, two, oh, five. Nine five two nine four six six two zero five. So I got to get to the cat story, just because this the, the story has just the description is just insane. A crystal woman is accused of hoarding a hundred and twenty four cats in a home that's since been boarded up after being found unfit for habitation. Meanwhile, nine of the cats with severe respiratory infections were had to be euthanized. Shauna Marie Duffy, forty seven faces 10 felony accounts for animal mistreatment. According to charges filed Monday in Hennepin County district court, she makes her first appearance May, April 30th. An attorney for her has not been enlisted. She did not return phone calls. The humane society and law enforcement began investigating Duffy following reports of illegal animal waste dumping in neighboring Plymouth, where police set up a camera and license plate reader along Bass Lake road to identify the suspect. How often were you doing this to where they set up a camera and uh, it's uh, the cat poop guy again. Uh, we got to we gotta do something about this. Dear Lord. Um, the man who is not identified in the criminal complaint admitted to dumping several bags, bags of cat droppings from his girlfriend's house. Uh, that's a moray. Uh, police went to Duffy's home February 2nd. Officers didn't find her, but they could hear numerous animals inside and were met by a very strong order of cat feces and urine while standing 10 to 15 feet away from the closed front door, charges said. You're 15 feet away from a closed building and you can already smell what's coming out of it. And she lived there. Oh, dear Lord. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. <laughs> Animal control returned a few weeks later, but Duffy wasn't home again. There was a strong order coming from the residents. Police and animal control, along with Animal and Humane Society, executed a search warrant at the end of February. Duffy was Home during the search when 96 cats and kittens were recovered. Officers also located one cat skull. Noted that the, that the air was thick with ammonia, according to charges. Every surface on the inside floors, walls, and any furniture were coated with mud-like substances determined to be dried cat feces and vomit. All the litter boxes were full. Happy dinner, by the way. All the litter boxes were full and occupied by cats. Felines were found in the crawl spaces under the main floor. Some were inacce inaccessible because of them climbing into holes in the wall and into furnace vents. Officers returned four more times in March to continue removing cats. Only one bowl of water was left in the kitchen sink filled by continuous drip and a medium-sized plastic tote bin of food was left open for 124 cats to eat. All of them were dehydrated and mal malnourished. City inspectors determined the home was unfit to live in and the Humane Society headquartered in Golden Valley conducted forensic exams of the cats in the most severe conditions. The veterinary findings noted that all 124 cats had upper respiratory infections with the majority having severe infections. About 70% were underweight. The majority of cats were unsocial, which presents a barrier in rehoming them. Graham Brayshaw, director of veterinary medicine at the Humane Society, said all surviving cats are at the Golden Valley shelter. And she had a boyfriend. Oh my! I okay. What? Uh, okay. This is just. I got to imagine. Okay, Crystal is not like farm lots. I mean, it's not St. Louis Park where it's like houses with five feet between them. Oh, <laughs> oh dear Lord! But it's not. You know, I'm going to guess what's the diff distance between a house and uh, there 20 feet, 30 feet between the houses. Oh God. The wind starts to blow. Oh my God. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, it's just hard to even comprehend this. Um, People like Duffy are blinded to the suffering they are inflicting on the animals, but once confronted with the severity of the problem, she willingly signed the cats over to the Humane Society 
avoiding a potential legal battle. Did you think, I mean, okay. I'll say this about cats, but there's a lot of people that have cats and there's some people that like cats roam. And I've said this about this before is that you're insane to do that because not only are there cars everywhere, there's coyotes and raccoons and no, Mr. Buttons has no chance against an animal that hunts to eat. And that's just that. That being said, that's one cat. How in the world you convince yourself a cat temple that no one could get near is a good idea? I, d- I don't know. I don't know. Native Roots Radio, that comes up next. We are back on a Wednesday. Have a good one. Till then, see ya.